Hello everybody, my name is Alex and I am an Early Career Fellow at the University of Nottingham. I'm interested in canopy architecture and how it influences light interception and photosynthesis. Today I'm going to talk about a variety of 3D reconstruction techniques for plant modelling created at Nottingham University. So as a brief overview, I'm going to talk about why we should study canopies and what approaches are there for 3D reconstruction and modelling. I'm going to briefly talk about 3D modelling of root systems and then I'll move on to the main bulk of the talk which will be the 3D reconstructions of shoot systems via two approaches plus their applications. And then finally I will end on a little bit on four dimensional modelling. So why study canopies? So if you think of a single plant, you'll get light from all sides, more resources are available per plant, and there'll be more branching and tillering leaf area as it grows sideways out into this space. So overall, you'll have a lower leaf area per unit ground area, but more per unit plant. <clears throat> In comparison to this, if you think of a community or a canopy, light will be predominantly from the top down. There'll be competition for light, nutrients and water. Stem elongation is more common, so upwards growth, there'll be less branching, less tillering and lower leaf area per plant, but higher leaf area index overall. So this is just some of the examples of why we need to study canopies and how changes in architecture will differ depending on how the plant is grown. So there are a number of different approaches on how you can model plants. So this is an exhaustive list, but we can split growth into, uh, well, plant modelling into growth modelling versus a snapshot or static modelling. So um, from this, it can then be split again. So there are individualised approaches where basically you computerise the image of your plants and create them in, in, in the computer, or generic or rule-based approaches where multiple measurements are taken of a plant. These are then averaged and a single plant model is created um, for which sort of represents the whole kind of species variety or whatever you're trying to look at. But today I'm going to focus on just image based approaches and how these can be used. So briefly, I'm going to just mention about the Hounsfield Centre. So the Hounsfield Centre is based at Sutton Boynton campus of the University of Nottingham, and it focuses on the 3D imaging of root systems to understand plant soil interactions and their response to environmental stress. Obviously, this doesn't just have to be root systems, but that's their main focus. But other things have been looked at, too, such as floral structure and development. Um, and a bit of shoot system work. So one key focus is the use of micro X-ray computed tomography for the study of soil structure and 3D root structure via non-invasive imaging. Um, and if you have any questions about this, please contact Craig Storick with his email at the top as he runs this facility. So the centre contains three different sized images for the different scales of root systems for which they analyse. So this short video shows the process of imaging a root system column in the largest of the scanners. So plants are grown in the integrated glasshouse, which is adjacent to the scanner. And to optimise the efficiency of imaging and due to the weight of the soil columns, a robot is used to move the candidate plants to the imager. This enables imaging to occur 24-7 if required um, due to the automation achieved by using a robot. The plants are loaded into the imager, which is effectively a modified medical scanner, and follow imaging, which takes approximately an hour, depending on the size of the plant. The robot then returns it to its original position. And this is all based on QR codes, which can scan and read which plant and locations.
So on this slide, the left shows the kind of image or structural model that you can obtain using this approach. A lot of editing goes into the output of the scanner to enable separation between the root structure and the surrounding soil, which I won't talk about today. But there is a list of the types of root traits that can be obtained using these images given on the right. And this is just an example of a wheat plant, which is two days old. So one example of this is the type of is a type of analysis that can be formed. So this results are from the Tomres project, an EU funded project to increase yield production and resource use of tomatoes. So the images along the bottom panel show the combined effect of altered water and nutrients on the rooting structure of an accession. And from these and then other processing steps, you can pull out a lot of interesting data relating to the structure and how they differ depending on the different um, variables present. So now I'm going to talk about methods for shoot reconstruction from RG images. So there are issues relating to imaging uh, shoot structure and a lot of these are due to occlusion, um, which basically means that most approaches are restricted to single plants, but depending on what you're kind of interested in and the level of detail you want to achieve. So if you imagine in a full canopy, a plant will be behind others, which will obscure the view. So it's important therefore to get as the best kind of images that you need to build the best model. So the first uh, process I'm gonna talk about is manual and a more affordable method created by Dr. Michael Pound, which consists of four different stages. So stage one is image capture, capture. And as I said, occlusion is often a problem. So for this reason, it's usual that plants are usually dug up from wherever they're growing in the field, if you wanna get canopy measurements and taken to a sort of imaging studio. So plants are placed on a manually rotating turntable with a clear background behind them. Alternatively, you can walk around the plant instead because you need to get views from all sides, but any background material will influence sort of the quality of the models that you can get out of it. So this is just one example of a setup where it's using three cameras, although only one is required. This is more for speed. There's the turntable, backing paper and a calibration target. So this calibration target is very important and it's the coloured disc in the centre and um, it is required in all of the images for the next stage. So stage two is the point cloud reconstruction. So this uses existing software called Visual SFM and Visual SFM generates positions. Uh, so it calibrates the cameras by matching features across the images. And this is why that calibration target is needed because there's a lack of texture on the plants, which makes them difficult to reconstruct. But this target can add that texture for you. So the image um, in the center shows the location of this target and each of the camera positions in a virtual environment. And then second application of this is um, PMVS or patch based multi view stereo, which is part of the visual SFM package. It then uses camera calibration files to project the points from 2D coordinates to a 3D point cloud. So this point cloud can then be used for further stages such as surface fitting, which I'll talk about now. So this is an example of a section of that kind of point cloud and some of the common issues that you find within it. So there's a number of problems that must be solved before the model suitable for further purposes. So in my case, this would be for ray tracing. So if I want to uh, model light within this canopy, there's all these gaps which will cause problems. So firstly, there's a lot of noise. So it's difficult to extract a surface from a small section of leaf. There's no surface data, so this is why you can't use it for ray tracing and the measurement's hard to compute. There's a lot of outliers, so points are spatially segregated and there's also non-leaf points and missing data. And this is especially common within the leaves because of the lack of texture. So this is the method that Mike came up with to counteract this when doing surface fitting. So Mike's process begins with clustering the point cloud using K nearest neighbors which basically separates the point cloud up into small clusters of points that are closest to each other. For each cluster, a best fit plane is then calculated and the points are projected to this plane. So therefore, each cluster basically becomes a 2D plane. 
The cluster is then triangulated and level sets are applied to refine the boundaries by expanding and shrinking the triangulated clusters with reference to the original RGB images. This is then applied to all clusters, which together builds up the model of a plant consisting of a mesh, basically, of triangles. Then the final step in this process, which I guess is optional, would be to put these models back together to form a representative in silico canopy. Um, so for this, you would take note of the planting densities of your plant or your crop and ensure that the spacings are the same and therefore sort of build, build this canopy that's representative of wherever the plant was removed from. So this is just an overview of the single plant reconstruction using Mike Pound's method. So you start with your set of images, and this is just one example of a wheat plant showing the calibration target clearly. You have your camera calibration and your point cloud generation using Visual SFM and PMVS. Then there's the surface fitting followed by canopy population. So one application of this would be phenotyping, and this is a process that I've used in the past. So this slide just shows some examples of five con architecturally contrasting rice lines. Um, there's a number of manual measurements given within the table, but then there's also digital me measurements which can be taken from these canopies. So the little images of the little thumbnails of the canopies show the final reconstructed rice canopies. And it's already clear to see that there are some big differences between these lines. So one advantage of using this method is the ability to calculate some things that wouldn't really be possible manually. So on the right, you can see cumulative leaf area index. So this is leaf area index as a function of depth through the canopy. So if you imagine taking one millimeter slices all the way down that canopy, it can build up a profile of how much leaf area is present with the steep of the line indicating a greater amount of leaf area present within that section of the canopy. And this is important because it will show you which areas have the most biomass. And it's also likely to highlight which areas is also intercepting the most light in the canopy. So I talked about light there. So the next stage of this would be linking this architecture to the environment. And for that, I used ray tracing. And this is the fast tracer produced by Songatal in Jingwen Zhu's group um, quite a few years back now. And it basically works by stimulating light from a certain source. And this is either direct light that comes from a simulated sun and therefore will move throughout the day or diffuse light, which can come from basically anywhere. And this is run over the course of the day on your whole canopy. And you can build up these different profiles. So along the bottom, there's just this graph showing the different um, components of light and how they may alter throughout the day. So if you imagine a single section of leaf within a canopy, it's going to receive highly variable levels of light. Um, so this is just an example, say, for one section, probably somewhere near the top of the canopy. So in general, from the all light or the black line, you see that light intensity is reasonably high, but these grey shaded out areas where light intensity drops indicate periods of time where the leaf is shaded, for example, by some overlapping foliage. And this leads to these drops in light intensity. So the one benefit of using this process is that each of the canopies that I work with is built up of roughly like a thousand triangles or whichever you want. So you can build up these profiles for a thousand different points within that canopy. One drawback is that at the moment, this currently um, assumes that it is a sunny day, wherever you are, so it doesn't account for weather. But there are some newer methods coming through now that are able to account for changes in cloud patterns and other things that will influence this light intensity as well. So one application of this would therefore be light and photosynthesis modelling. And these are just two different examples of my work. Um, on the left is using a empirical acclimation model to predict what is the optimal photosynthesis for any position in the canopy, given the um, past light environment. So given this ray tracing output, what can you expect? And this is interesting because it indicated that 
from measured results using an infrared gas exchange analyzer produced by Lycor, you would get you get much higher levels of photosynthesis than would be predicted using this acclimation model. And this indicates, at least for wheat, that they are accumulating a lot of nitrogen at lower levels in the canopy, which is surplus to requirement. On the right, there's a, another recent paper. So this is basically looking at uh, NPQ or non-photochemical quenching throughout a rice canopy and how protective, protective this process is depending upon the position in the canopy and what levels of light that the rice leaf receives. So that was one method and it was the sort of more manual method for creating these 3D models. But the second method is an active vision approach to plant reconstruction. And active vision is the process of automatically capturing images of an object or an environment using a set of rules. And this process was created by Dr. Jonathan Gibbs, also based at the University of Nottingham. And it consists of five different stages. So this setup requires three different components, which together form the active vision cell or AVC. So these components are an RGB camera, a robot arm, and this is the, the, the universal robot UR5 robot arm, although others are also possible, and a high precision turntable. So unlike Mike's previous method, this requires calibration of all of the components within this active vision cell. So calibration only actually needs to be done once before the image capture stage and is done using a checkerboard. Um, this can then be removed so it's not required in the images with the plants, which is a benefit over Mike's previous method. And it also means that dimensions are automatically captured. So all dimensions of the plant will remain true to real life. Um, but the calibration does need redoing if any of the components are moved. So image capture then proceeds as follows. So the robot arm guides the camera and collects an initial image set from the target plant. This is then used to create an initial volumetric model. So I'll show more of that on the next page, but a volumetric model is basically made up of voxels, so little cubes that represent your plant form. A next best view algorithm then evaluates this volumetric model. And if the image is redundant, it was removed from the image set, or if the data is of low quality, then the robot will guide the camera back and take additional images to improve that given area. So the next stage of this is split into sort of two. So firstly, the point cloud representation, and this uses the same visual SFM approach as Mike's method, but this has problems with noise, outliers, and again, missing data. So you'll often have additional background information or a non-uniform point cloud. So those points aren't evenly spaced. So Jonathan's method also creates a plant poxy representation or a PPR. So this is a voxel based model. As you can see, each the plant is represented by little cubes, but it does contain additional data. So this method cannot deal with concavities. So it will add thickness to leaf material and you won't get like the sharp edges and leaves that you would expect. But one advantage of using this method is that it has hierarchical ray tracing, which reduces the computations when forming these voxels or cubes. So it's a much faster approach. So stage four is then merging these two models together. So the PPR and the point cloud are merged together and simplified. So this helps to remove the noise and it reduces the computational requirements required in the latter stages. It also produces a more even point cloud. So when it goes to the next stages, it's, it's much easier to define the whole shape when the points are evenly spaced. So the final stage is surface reconstruction. So Jonathan's approach uses a modified clustering algorithm, which divides the simplified point cloud into clusters, as shown in the left image. So this approach is similar to spectral clustering, which is another state of the art method of clustering, but again, with some reduced um, computational requirements. 
So then you work with these initial clusters. The clusters are then triangulated and they become what's known as cells. Level sets are applied to them. These are then smoothed and then the cells are merged together before a final smoothing set. So this basically will build up your whole plant in the same kind of mesh, but all the cells are merged together. So you won't get the gaps in between the leaf structure and the mesh as you would, for example, with Mike's method. And along the bottom is just some examples with different types of plants and different structures. So another benefit of this method is that it is able to preserve any three dimensional structures. So, for example, the aloe vera. Whereas the plane fitting method that Mike uses wouldn't be able to because it will flatten these all to a plane. So this is just that overview again for a bromeliad is one of your RGB images on the left. And again, note that you don't need to have this calibration target in the image, which means you can get some of the views like the side on view that wouldn't be possible using the manual method. So this is then used to generate a point cloud and a volumetric model. These models are then merged together to create the merged model. And then the surfaces are fitted via surface reconstruction to create your final model. So finally, I'm just going to talk about some of the work we've been doing recently on four dimensional plant imaging. And this was a BBSRC funded project to look at how basically wind movement affects plants. So if you think of a plant growing outside in the field, it will be subject to wind, which alters the morphology and changes light attenuation through that canopy. So I previously modeled this using full body rotation in rice, but this is basically where you take your three dimensional model, which I created using Mike Pound's method, and then tip the whole thing about the central axes just to simulate this movement. But this does not account for the individual organ movements because wind will affect the structure differentially depending on the architecture present. So we first started looking at this using 2D field tracking over time. So this approach used deep learning to detect ear tips within wheat. Um, this is a modified YOLO deep learning network, which uses augmentations of the wheat ears to build up the data set. The network was trained. And then at the same time, we create, we captured videos in the field of these ears moving. These videos were then split into frames. The ear tips were detected in them and then they were tracked over time. And this required maintenance of feature identity between the frames in the video. So this short video on the right just shows the kind of output that we get from this. So each of those tips were detected and identified and maintained over the frames. So you could build up the movement pathways or tra trajectories of the individual ears. So the little graph on the bottom left just shows some of these trajectories um, with the time showing how long uh, each of these movement paths took. So from this, you can already start to imagine <clears throat> that these paths will be influenced by different traits of the canopy, for example, the height and then the weight of the ear and other things. And these are, was just during a short gust of wind, but it's possible that under different uh, windy environments that this will change dramatically. So thank you for listening to my presentation today about some of the examples of creating 3D plant models available um, produced by 
the University of Nottingham. And I'd like to thank these people for their help. So on the shoot imaging side, there's Jonathan Gibbs, Eric Murchie, Tony Pridmore and Michael Pound. Um, if you have any questions on robotics, active vision or deep learning, then feel free to contact Jonathan Gibbs. Um, and then for the Hounsfield facility and 3D X-ray imaging, uh, these are just a few of the people involved in that kind of work. And if you have any questions for that, please contact, contact Craig Stork. Thank you.